Happy Friday, and welcome to the Meet the DM Drug Developer session with the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation. We are very excited to have Avidity Biosciences with us today. They are going to be talking about Marina data, a preliminary assessment from the phase one, two clinical trial for DM1. Just a bit about the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation. We envision a world with treatments and a cure for myotonic dystrophy. The mission of the foundation is community, care, and a cure. We support and connect the myotonic dystrophy community. We provide resources and advocate for care. We accelerate research towards treatment and a cure. A shout out for our resources and support available from the foundation. You can find toolkits and publications, including clinical care recommendations at myotonic.org slash toolkits dash publications. Our support programs, including our support groups are available at myotonic.org slash find dash support. You can find all of our calendar of events on myotonic.org slash calendar slash month and our digital academy, which hosts all of our presentations, including presentations from our annual conference at myotonic.org slash digital dash academy. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be added to the digital academy, hopefully by the end of today. And if not, it should be there early next week. We are excited to have with us today, Dr. Mike Flanagan. He joined in, 20, in January of 2021 as Avidity's Chief Technical Officer. Dr. Flanagan has extensive experience developing multiple therapeutic modalities, including RNA therapeutics, antibody drug conjugates, and bispecific antibodies. Prior to joining Avidity, Dr. Flanagan served as Senior Director and Project Team Leader, Oncology and Immunology for Genentech, where he advanced programs through late stage research to end a phase two development. Prior to Genentech, he served in roles of increasing responsibility in the biology groups at Sinesis Pharmaceuticals, Gilead, and Merck, where he was senior director of RNA sciences. He received his bachelor's of science in genetics from UC Davis and his PhD in biological sciences from UC Irvine, and was an American Cancer Society postdoctoral fellow at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Stanford University. Also with us today is Dr. Nick Johnson from Virginia Commonwealth University. He is the Marina Principal Investigator. He treats adults and children with both common and rare neuromuscular conditions, and his work does not end in the clinic. He dedicates significant time each week to laboratory research. And as part of the team at VCU Health, working to advance the treatment of genetic muscle disorders with a special emphasis on muscular dystrophies. Dr. Johnson is board certified in neurology, neuromuscular medicine, and neuromuscular pathology by the American Academy of Neurology and serves on the Government Relations Committee. He serves as the co-principal investigator of the Myotonic Dystrophy Clinical Research Network and is a member of the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation's Scientific Advisory Committee. We are fortunate to have with us today, Kelly DiCiapani. In September of 2020, Kelly joined Avidity as Vice President of, Med of Medical Affairs. Kelly brings extensive commercial and medical affairs leadership in the life sciences industry focused on bringing innovative therapeutics to patients in the oncology and rare disease spaces, including Gleevec, Soliris, and Imbruvica. Throughout her career, Kelly has held positions in industry and academia across roles in research, commercial and medical affairs at Orthobiotech, Novartis Oncology, Duke University, Alexion Pharmaceuticals, Pharmacyclics, Versardis, and Lovelance Biotherapeutics. Kelly received both her Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Duke University. Okay. Many of you were able to submit questions in advance during the registration process. Thank you very much. We had hundreds of questions submitted. 
and our presenters are doing their absolute best to try to address your questions today. There is a good chance that not all of them will be addressed given how many questions were submitted, but they will be doing their best to integrate that into the presentation. If you did not have a chance to ask questions or you have questions that arise from the presentation, you can ask those questions live. Just go to the questions tab of GoToWebinar, type in your question and click send. If you have a smartphone, click on the question mark icon at the top of the screen, type your question and click send. They'll be answering questions during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. If today's program speaks to you, please consider showing your appreciation with a donation to MDF. Together, we will change the future of myotonic dystrophy. It is my great pleasure to now welcome the Avid Avidity Biosciences team. Thank you, Tanya. It is such an honor to be here this morning. I appreciate the kind introduction. As Tanya mentioned, my name is Kelly D. Trapani, and I'm the VP of Medical Affairs here at Avidity Biosciences. I'd like to thank the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation for inviting our team to share an update on Avidity's progress in developing potential treatments for the DM1 community. We're so excited to share with you information from a preliminary assessment of the MARINA trial, which is our phase 1-2 clinical trial investigating the potential for AOC 1001 to treat individuals with myotonic dystrophy type 1. Thank you to so many of you for submitting your thoughtful questions ahead of our presentation today. We look forward to answering those questions throughout our talk, as well as during the Q&A session. One reminder, if you are a participant in the MARINA trial, we ask that you please do not disclose that or any information about your personal experience in the trial today. It is important to do this to maintain the integrity of the study, since it is an ongoing and blinded clinical trial. Next slide, please. Before we get started, we remind everyone that we will be making forward-looking statements. So our commitment on slide three, Avidity, at Avidity, our mission is to improve the lives of people affected by diseases with limited therapeutic options by advancing a new class of drugs. Our team's extensive experience in drug development in combination with our commitment to involving patients and their families at every step of the way is truly the foundation of our company and drives us to advance new treatments. We want to express our profound gratitude to the researchers and clinicians and healthcare providers that have dedicated their careers to caring for people living with myotonic dystrophy and for laying the groundwork for companies like Avidity. Your work, through the efforts of DMCRN and studies like NDM1, have provided the DM1 community with the critical information to enable trials like MARINA. We are also so grateful to our advocacy partners like the MDF and to the community for providing your time and insights in support of deepening the understanding of myotonic dystrophy. In addition, on the next slide, we want to thank you, the MARINA participants, we are incredibly grateful to the partnership that we have with the clinicians and investigators and all of their teams working on the MARINA study, as well as also, most importantly, the participants in the study. We want to thank each participant, their families, our advocacy partners, as well as the investigators for their time, commitment, and continued contributions. We acknowledge that it takes an incredible act of courage to enroll in a clinical trial at an early stage, and we are very grateful to you, the participants in the MARINA study, and the partnership that we have with you. On slide six, I'd like to share some information about our safety and the study update. So the data that we share today with you is very early. It's what we call a preliminary assessment, and we're looking at initial data from the first two dose cohorts in the study. In the case of the one milligram cohort, these people received one dose, and the two milligram cohort is data up to six weeks after a second dose. So there's still a lot to learn. And as the study progresses, we will be sharing additional information with you. It's also important to note and to highlight 
that the MARINA trial is currently on what is called a partial clinical hold for new participant enrollment. The partial hold is in response to a single, serious, rare, and specific adverse event that was reported by a participant. The safety of participants in our clinical studies is our top priority. We have not seen any similar events and other participants in either the MARINA study or the MARINA open label extension study, and we're continuing to work with the participant and study investigator to investigate the event and follow up with the FDA. Under the terms of the hold, participants already in the MARINA study or in the MARINA open label extension study may continue to receive investigational treatment with AOC 1001, and they may roll over into the open label extension study as well. However, there are no new participants enrolling at this time. We continue to work to resolve this partial clinical hold on new participant enrollment as swiftly as possible. On slide seven, I'd like to move to telling you a little bit about what we'll be talking about today. Today, we'll show you some safety and tolerability information observed in the study, and then we'll go through the cascade of things that we needed to do to get AOC um, into the muscle. First is delivering AOC 1001 to the muscle. The next step in the cascade is after delivery must to the muscle is knocking down DMPK. Then the next question is, will AOC 1001 show an impact on the disease mechanism? And finally, are there signs of early clinical activity? And for today's agenda, you'll be hearing from Dr. Johnson and Dr. Flanagan about all of these pieces. Um, in addition to what I've already covered, we'll be sharing a high-level overview about our technology and approach to the development of a potential treatment for DM1. And we're very privileged and honored to have Dr. Johnson join us on the call as well. Many of you know him well, and he's a physician as uh, Tanya nicely um, introduced him at BCU, and also is the principal investigator on the NDM1 study and a principal investigator, the principal investigator for the MARINA study. He and Dr. Flanagan, our Avidity CTO, will be sharing the data from the preliminary assessment and answering the questions that I shared in the last slide. From there, we'll move into your Q&A. So next, I'm going to highlight our technology. Our technology offers a new approach to exon skipping. Our potential treatments are called antibody oligonucleotide conjugates, or AOCs for short, which is a lot easier to say. AOCs can be designed to target the root cause of disease like DM1. We are developing AOCs with the goal to treat the genetic cause of muscle diseases, including myotonic dystrophy type one. The building blocks of AOCs are on the next slide. The AOC platform combines the proven technology of two existing drug types that are well understood for each of their specific properties in drug development. Antibodies are naturally occurring proteins made by the body to help fight infections. They are commonly used in drug development because they can be made to target almost any protein, including those that are different between one cell type and another. They are well characterized for safety and are the foundation of over 100 approved drugs many of which are for chronic conditions. At Avidity, we're using the antibody as a vehicle to deliver our drugs to the muscle and heart cells. Oligos are short strands of DNA or RNA, and they can be powerful drugs because they can change gene expression or how the body makes a protein by targeting RNA. There are currently multiple approved oligo drugs as well, many of which are disease-modifying treatments. At Avidity, we use our oligos and the AOCs that are tailored or created specifically to target the root cause of DM1. AOC 1001 uses a type of oligo called a small interfering RNA. For AOC 1001, it works by harnessing a natural biologic process in the cell called RNA interference. RNA interference is a mechanism used by your body to fight off things like RNA containing viruses. What happens is the siRNA is loaded into a protein complex, shown here as the Pac-Man. Once loaded into the protein complex, it chews up its target RNA. So in the case of DM1, AOC 1001 chews up the mutant DMPK RNA. On the next slide, we are developing AOC 1001 to reduce the toxic DMPK RNA in muscle and heart cells. This slide kind of pulls it all together and shows you how AOC 1001 works. 
the antibody we're using sticks to a certain receptor that normally sits on the outside of a muscle cell. The receptor is called the transferrin receptor. And when the antibody finds and binds the to the transferrin receptor, the receptor pulls the antibody into the inside of the cell. Once inside the cell, the oligo is let go and it can do its job, which is to bind to the protein complex and chew up the toxic DMPK RNA. On slide 13, um, AOC 1001 has a compelling preclinical package that really laid the groundwork for the uh, presentation that you'll hear next from Nick and from um, Mike. So AOC 1001 um, in our preclinical research had a clean toxicology profile and that we were able to show that we are able to deliver AOC 1001 to the muscle cells, um, which in turn leads to knockdown of mutant T DMPK. This results in improvement in splicing, in splicing, excuse me, in human DM1 patient myotubes. These splicing improvements demonstrate that AOC 1001 is reducing mutant DMPK RNA in the nucleus, in lab and animal models, and supported the design of the MARINA trial that we are talking about today. And next, I'm going to introduce and hand over now to Nick Johnson, who will walk you through some of the information on the MARINA study. Thanks so much, Nick. Great, thanks uh, Kelly for the introduction. Um, and we can go to the next slide. Um, so I'm uh, Vice Chair of Research here at Virginia Commonwealth University. We can go to the next slide. Um, and for many of you on the call, this is a reminder about what causes myotonic dystrophy type 1. So normally you have the DMPK gene um, and um, it has a short number of repeats. Uh, but in myotonic dystrophy type 1, you have a repeat expansion um, that uh, becomes toxic um, at the RNA level um, and sequesters RNA splicing proteins. And so the way I think about it is like you have a, a clothing factory and you have squares of fabric and they're supposed to be cut into shirts or pants or dresses. Uh, but because your uh, pair of scissors is bound up by the repeats, you're not able to make proteins the right shape. And that's what causes a number of the disease uh, features. Next slide. Uh, and and myotonic dystrophy truly does affect um, almost every organ system in the body, uh, which you can see here on this um, slide, including the heart, the lungs, the muscle, uh, the brain, and the vision. Next slide. Um, but um, to really focus in on a couple of key points uh, or areas where, um, based on the preclinical um, um, information, uh, this current molecule might be able to um, reach. Uh, in the muscle specifically, it's in the name. It causes the myotonia or delayed muscle relaxation, the muscle weakness and wasting, and can also cause muscle pain in the heart. Um, it can cause the uh, difficulty breathing and the sleep apnea, uh, and in the uh, excuse me, in the respiratory system and in the heart, it can cause that um, cardiac arrhythmia. Um, that's so important to monitor, and of course, in the gastrointestinal symptoms, swallowing issues. Uh, irritable bowel, uh, diarrhea, constipation uh, can all um, come as part of the disease. Next slide. But um, I want to focus in on one particular um, symptom here, which is the myotonia. So uh, the myotonia, many of you on the call know this already. If you try and squeeze your hand tight and open it up, you can see that the muscles don't relax as well as what you um, what you would want. Um, and that can lead to a number of difficulties with your hands. Um, and this um, data is taken from a survey, survey of 1,100 individuals with myotonic dystrophy um, called the CRISPR project, including 457 individuals with myotonic dystrophy type one. And what you can see called out on the graph on the left is that myotonia is a very prevalent symptom in the um, disease, affecting over 80% um, of individuals. Um, but okay, so it's there, but what, what kind of problems does it cause? Um, if you look at the uh, graph on the right, you can see that, you know, probably the most prevalent challenge um, that individuals with myotonic dystrophy can have, as, as I know you know, is handling objects. So opening jars, knobs, um, and some of that um, disability can come from the myotonia combined with the muscle weakness. Um, but certainly the myotonia as well. Next slide. 
Um, so, you know, I just, those slides really in, highlight the importance of myotonia that's a prevalent cause of disability. Um, we didn't talk about this, but um, a lot of work has gone in um, over the years um, from the Thornton Lab in Rochester uh, and other groups that has really tied and linked the fact that that repeat is expanded. A particular gene called the chloride channel is not made the right way, and that's what causes um, uh, the myotonia. So it's really tied. The myotonia is probably most directly tied to the repeat expansion. Um, and we're particularly interested in it because we think that um, things like myotonia might change faster than things like strength or weakness. And so uh, for us, it's been something that we've really focused in and thought about in terms of um, um, early clinical trials, like the one we're gonna talk about today. Next slide. So um, the design um, and characteristics of the um, MARINA study are informed by um, the DMCRN and the international NDM1 study, uh, which is supported in part by the Myotonic Tissue Foundation. Um, you can see the uh, clinical sites for the NDM1 study as a whole uh, right now. So it's a, it is really an international study across the United States, Europe, uh, New Zealand, and soon to be Canada. And this study is enrolling 700 individuals to better understand um, the characteristics of myotonic dystrophy and how to pre predict progression as part of a clinical trial uh, with a 24-month um, time in that and, and looking at a number of different endpoints, patient-reported outcomes, and patient population characteristics. Next slide. This next slide shows um, the specific goals of the NDM1 study. So to characterize the severity and progression over two years in a very large um, group of individuals with myotonic dystrophy type one, we're about halfway there in terms of enrollment, not quite there. And then to focus in on a biomarker um, to help us um, understand um, the relationship between the repeat, um, the clinical features and the RNA toxicity that we know as part of the disease. Next slide. And this schematic shows uh, essentially for individuals participating in the study that you have a visit at baseline, there's an optional muscle biopsy at three months, uh, and then again at 24 months, uh, and study visits are pretty simple. It's um, every year for two years total. Uh, and this work has really been um, uh, a great partnership between um, um, the NDM1, the DMCRN, as well as um, 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 the FDA Orphan Product Division, and finally, um, our industry partners like Avidity, Dyn, and Trotta, and Vertex, who are um, focused on uh, moving clinical trial programs forward. Next slide. So with all that being said, um, you know, those data, that, that design have uh, fed forward into um, the trial design for the MARINA and MARINA Open Label um, study. Go to the next slide. Um, so here uh, for the MARINA study, this is an early phase clinical trial design. So um, chiefly designed to assess the safety and tolerability of the um, molecule that uh, Kelly showed earlier. And um, the, the planned enrollment was around 44 adults with myotonic dystrophy type one, um, men and women aged 18 to 65 with a genetic diagnosis of myotonic dystrophy type one with symptoms of myotonic dystrophy type one, uh, and able to walk independently for at least 10 meters um, during screening. And the um, picture on the right shows the clinical trial sites um, that participated as part of um, um, this particular study. Next slide. Um, and, um, you know, I really want to commend um, my colleagues at Davidity for uh, making this as easy as possible. Um, participating in early phase clinical trials such as this is, is difficult. It's, it's a pretty busy study uh, with all the focus on safety and tolerability. And so um, it's been designed uh, with input, input from you, all of you in the community with the goals to minimize uh, barriers to participation and enhance the overall experience. So things like home health and telemedicine um, were made available for select study visits, uh, travel concierge to allow for um, um, reimbursement or um, travel to the sites, uh, and then reimbursement um, for study-related expenses. Next slide. Um, so this is um, a pretty busy slide, so I'm take just a second um, to get through it. Um, so this is the overall trial design for both the MARINA and the MARINA open label trial design. 
Um, so you can see that in the marina study, there are four um, um, planned uh, groups. Um, there is an initial group uh, A, which receives a single low dose of the study drug. And then uh, following that, there were um, subsequent groups that received higher doses of the study drug uh, and also not just received higher doses, but also received multiple doses over the course of the trial participation. And that uh, individuals in the trial had a three to one randomization, which means that for every three people that got um, the study drug, one person got placebo. Um, and um, fortunately, you know, there's the ability for all participants to roll over to the open label extension, uh, which you can see there um, uh, on the right hand side, which is um, essentially um, the same dose, two milligrams per kilogram uh, for any individual in any cohort um, and with um, uh, essentially quarter, quarterly dose quarterly doses um, following one booster after six weeks. So right now it's planned for a 24 month uh, treatment and nine month observation duration. Next slide. So that's a lot of information. That's a lot of, uh, it's a pretty complicated trial design. Um, and we're not gonna talk about most of it. What we're gonna talk about is the very beginning of the trial, which is that blue box there, which is the uh, patients in the single dose, cohort A, and then those individuals who received multiple doses at the next highest dose. Next slide. Um, and to kind of drill into that um, even further, um, what you can see, um, the data that uh, Mike is going to show you in just a minute, um, is really based on um, um, the biopsies that occurred at baseline and then day 43 for that single dose. So, you know, about a month and a half after they received a single dose. Um, and then um, in cohort B1, it's the, um, there are biopsies at baseline day 92 and day 183. We're just gonna be looking at the day 92 or about uh, um, three months after um, 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 the, um, the study um, drug and uh, before the next um, dose. And um, in terms of the participant numbers, um, you can see that in the table there for the um, one milligram per kilogram, which is the lowest dose, there were eight total participants. Um, um, there um, uh, for the day 43 um, in the one milligram per kilogram to cohort, there was insufficient tissue for a single patient. So the day you'll see is six active and then two placebo at baseline and then five active and two placebo at day 43. And then for the two milligram per kilogram dose, um, you can see there's uh, 12 uh, participants uh, and then nine active, three placebo. Um, and then um, you can see for the day 92, um, uh, there's um, uh, gonna be eight active and three placebo. And part of what that um, those numbers are reflect the fact that this is an ongoing trial um, and that um, in some cases the tissues aren't uh, shipped and haven't been analyzed um, to date. So um, I really want to commend the company for taking the time to show some of the data um, as the work continues to be ongoing. Next slide. Um, and then this is looking at the individuals who are in those um, cohorts. So you can see on average um, uh, pretty even ages between cohorts A1 and B1, uh, about 38 years old with a, a wide a range of ages. Um, uh, predominantly females in both uh, cohort A1 and B1, um, and then with pretty normal weights. And then you can see the CTG repeat lengths. So you remember that 50, over 50 um, is what causes disease, and then over 150 is really more associated with the late, uh, or excuse me, the um, typical adult um, um, disease. And so you can see the range there, 150 to 750, and then 150 to 1250. So a little bit a longer um, in the cohort B1. Um, uh, but fortunately, looking at the splicing baseline. So this is um, a measure, uh, it's taken from the muscle biopsy. It's a measurement of the RNA splicing changes um, that are seen with disease. So um, these are all the um, proteins that aren't made the right way because um, the RNA splicing machinery is affected by the repeat expansion. Um, and on that composite of 22 different splicing events, 
um, the higher the number, the more severe it is. So zero would be normal and uh, 100 would be um, really as that's as severe can, as you can get. So the baseline splicing across the groups um, are about 74 um, and 72, but you can see the range there at the bottom. Next slide. Um, so um, in summary, so uh, myotonic dystrophy, as you all know, is a prevalent disease with significant morbidity and mortality. Um, uh, the natural history studies have informed the therapeutic trial design that I, I went over, including um, the outcome assessments that we used and the biomarkers, and we provided that support to the Avidity program. Um, and the data presented today is a very early midpoint look at the marina six weeks post dose in one or um, post one or two doses of the of the lowest doses, and that in general that the um, fortunately the cohorts were pretty evenly matched. And with that, I will pass it over to Mike to talk about uh, the data. All right, thanks, Nick, and and good morning, everyone. Um, on behalf of Avidity investigators, the Myotonic Dystrophy Research Network, and most importantly, the patients who volunteered to our, our trial. And as Kelly had outlined, it's, it's really brave to, to volunteer for these kind of early trials. I'm, I'm excited to present this midpoint analysis of a MARINA trial. Now, just as background, I'm trained as a molecular biologist. So we're gonna go deep into the cell to kind of understand uh, the mechanism of action, how our potential therapeutic works on the cell, and then and then Nick will show you kind of what we see as early functional benefit. So let me just go through that kind of cascade of events that we've seen, and then we'll really drill down into what's happened at the at the molecular level. But I'm hoping when you when you come from this uh, presentation. That also, you know, as the holidays are coming up and you're you're sitting around the dining room table talking about you know talking about different things that people can you can also kind of relate to people how this works at the molecular level. So I'll try to keep it interesting but high level at the same time and try to avoid my inner molecular biologist part. Uh, so first just gives you this cascade of events that occurs. We'll first talk about uh, safety and tolerability. It's really an ongoing trial. We're at our lowest doses, so we're still learning a lot. Uh, we've learned a lot to date, and we'll continue to learn um, additionally about the safety and tolerability of our, our um, AOC 1001. We'll first show you delivery to muscle, which is the first step in the process that needs to happen in this cascade. And it really opens up a broad potential for the, uh, the platform for other potential, you know, we've already gone into FSHD, which is really an important um, muscle weakness disease, uh, M or DMD, we're looking at that also and have a trial up and going now for that. So, and then beyond that in our pipeline, Earlier in, in stages, we have a number of other muscle programs that we'll be happy to present at a later time. Following delivery to muscle, which you know was super exciting for us to really be able to demonstrate the platform, is can we deliver the oligo, like Kelly talked about, that engages the target, in this case, mutant DMPK that you've heard about, and can it reduce the uh, mutant DMPK? And we see a reduction of, of DMPK in every participant that we treated with AOC 1001. And we see an average decrease at our lowest doses of about 45% in our, in our treated patients. So it's between delivery to muscle, the knockdown of DMPK, that, that was a first for us and really helps validate the platform. And again, allows us to then open up additional rare muscle diseases for potential treatment. Now, specifically for uh, DM1, what we've seen is that once we've knocked down DMPK, that we saw an impact on the disease mechanism. And, you, and you've heard a little bit about um, DMPK and how it works. What we've shown is that we improve splicing. So this is, um, we are able to improve splicing across a panel of different genes that's really been identified by this, the research network, as well as we see when we look at specific muscle genes, we see a 31% improvement. We were super excited to see this. 
we weren't necessarily expecting this deep of response early on. Um, so when we saw these data, we were really interested to see if it had any of the early um, clinical signs of activity. And we looked at some of the uh, videos from patients where they had hand opening um, videos and we were able to see some early responders and Nick will uh, show some of those videos. Next slide. Just wanna talk about the safety and um, tolerability. Safety of our participants is our top priority in, in all our clinical trials and especially our first clinical trial. It's really important to us. And you can see that it's a relatively, it's early in the trial and we have very few patients, only 20. Um, but what you can see, well, we also have the, the four mig per kg, so we have 13 there. So this includes not only our one mig, but our two mig and four mig safety data to give you a better sense at our higher dose. Now recall, we are on a partial clinical hold, so we're, we're not able to enroll uh, any additional patients. The patients that are currently on trial continu can continue to get the dosing, uh, and then we'll roll over into the open label extension. What I like to point out is that um, when you look at any adverse event, uh, you can see that it's pretty well matched across all the different cohorts. And that's what that means is that as a patient or participant comes into the clinic, you know, if they report anything like a headache, uh, a cold, all those get reported. And you can see from people who are on drug or are on placebo, it looks very similar. Probably the most important line to look at is what would be um, serious adverse events. And you can see we have uh, two serious adverse events. The one, let's focus the one on at one mig per, or four megs per kg. That one um, participant is uh, the participant that had a serious adverse event leading to our partial clinical hold. And we're working uh, with the sites and uh, to better understand that rare event. Uh, but I just wanted to point that out. The other um, serious adverse event that occurred at our two meg per gig, that was unrelated to um, study. It was related to a elective surgery that that participant had while on our study. And it was related to a reaction to pain medications uh, during the recuperation from that elective surgery. Other things I just want to point out, and it's kind of on the right panel, is that the majority of these um, treatment of emergent adverse events. The most common ones are COVID-19 at 16% and headaches. Again, at 16% really you know, points to the what we are in currently still a pandemic and uh, is illustrated by our, our clinical trial also. Other AEs that we've seen are inf infusion-related reactions, which uh, occur with a biologic. Um, we've seen some uh, reductions in hemoglobin, elevations in some of ASTs and ALTs, but importantly, no changes in bilirubin, and we've seen no th thrombocytopenia and no renal impairment has been reported. We talked about the severe adverse events. So we're continuing to monitor, uh, monitor patients, and again, uh, these are our early and lowest doses initially, but it looks to, at this point that we have a, a favorable safety profile. So let's go to the next slide. And we'll talk again about the cascade of events. And this, this just kind of shows you um, what needs to happen and, and tries to outline kind of the temporal nature. And I'll drill down a little bit in each of the, the different mechanisms. So first, the most important thing for us was initially, can we deliver to muscle? We, we've never been able to deliver to muscle in this way, and this is really targeted delivery, and it opens up again the broad platform for, for us to look not only at DM1, but DM2 and beyond uh, to FSHD and DMD. So we're really excited about that. The second thing is once we deliver to muscle, can we bind to the target and inhibit that target? And I'll show you those data soon where we show that every patient we treated, we see inhibition and reduction of DMPK. That reduction of DMPK leads to improved splicing. And the way that I like to think about it, and when I talk to my parents about it, like they ask you, what do you, you know, we just had Thanksgiving, 
Like, what are you doing? I don't, I don't really understand what you're doing. And I kind of like to think about it as um, DMPK uh, binds up a protein that's really important for this splicing. And that that protein has a an unusual name, and it and we can talk about where the name came from. But it's called muscle blind like protein. And this this protein is very important for allowing the product the correct splicing of all your messenger RNAs that lead to correct protein expression that then allows your body to function properly with the right proteins. And what, what the DMPK repeats do, uh, they bind up this muscle blind like protein and sequester it kind of like a clog in your sink. So it kind of clogs up this mechanism and you don't get, you don't get the water or the messenger RNAs flowing properly and making the right protein. So what we're trying to do with our AOC 1001 is to slowly unclog that drain. And at our earliest doses, we're start, starting to see this drain probably getting unclogged, releasing this muscle blind like protein or allowing the newly synthesized muscle blind like protein from being sequestered that then leads to that improvement that we see ultimately leading to functional benefit. So I, I like to think about it and, and try to explain it to my parents or in-laws that it's really kind of like trying to unclog the sink and we're, we're slowly trying to unclog it and we're starting to see it, uh, that clog break up at these earliest doses. So next slide, please. So this is the first step um, and we talked about it is delivery to muscle. And what, what, you can, what you can see is that we show AOC technology can deliver sRNA muscles. And what you can see on the y-axis is the concentration of our um, oligonucleotide in muscle six weeks after a dose. On the x-axis gives you the doses that we've looked at today, one, two, and four. Um, and what you can see is that finally, I mean, it's been 30 years, we've worked on it at Avidity for 10 years, we finally have the ability to deliver sRNAs to muscle. And this graph, this single graph that's taken us 10 years to produce uh, shows how we can deliver to muscle. And we see a nice dose proportional increase in muscle. And we see that uh, even at our lowest doses, we're reaching concentrations that we think from our non-clinical studies should be therapeutic, uh, therapeutically active. So we were we were wondering whether our non-clinical uh, models like mice, like non-human primates, would be able to predict what happens in humans, and they do seem to predict pretty well. Now this is um, a biopsy from the anterior tibialis. So that's a muscle that's down on the front of your calf that's involved in kind of being able to pull your toes towards your, your shin bone. Uh, and that's where we take the biopsy and that's how we measure our oligonucleotide. So now having seen this delivery of muscle, next slide, we are really excited to look at DMPK inhibition. And what you can see here at both doses, either a single dose, our lowest dose, one mg per kg shown in the light blue, or our two mg per kg shown after two doses, we see that every participant treated with AOC 1001 showed a reduction in DMPK. Shown in the gray are the placebo group, and you can see that they did not see reduction in DMPK. Of course, those patients are able to roll over now into our open label extension, but every patient that we, that we um, was dosed with AOC 1001 showed a decrease in DMPK. So what we, what we then tried to look at is, okay, um, what, is the, what is the percent reduction in this patient? So we've combined these bars. Um, these are each individual patient showing the knockdown. We've combined them together. And here's what you see is that we see meaningful reduction of DMPK RNA of 45% after a single dose shown in the light blue bar or two doses at two mg per kg shown in the dark blue bar. Our goal was to kind of hit around 50% um, reduction in DMPK. And having talked to key opinion leaders like Nick and others, 
um, especially others that are involved in the, the clinical network, the myotonic clinical network, they suggested around 50% knockdown of DMPK might lead to um, encouraging signs of splicing. So what we then looked at was what does splicing look like? And that's shown on the next slide. So remember, um, DMPK binds up this protein called muscle blind-like protein. Muscle blind-like protein has to be released to then allow splicing of your, of your messenger RNA. And that splicing of the messenger RNA results in the production of the correct or the right protein. That new protein that's now corrected needs to replace the proteins that are currently in your muscle and try to replace them and bring in new uh, corrected proteins to replace the previously um, misspliced proteins and mis, um, mismade uh, proteins. So what we show here is that while we don't see very much activity at our lowest dose, one mg per kg after a single dose, what we do see is a dose-dependent splicing improvements as we have sustained knockdown of DMPK. So we think that this indicates that one, we're, we're seeing splicing improvements, and two, that you have to continuously knock down DMPK to allow this splicing, which makes sense if we go back to the, the analogy of a, of a sink that if you start unclogging your sink, you don't want to put new potato peels down it. So we're, we're trying to kind of unclog it and keep it unclogged to allow this new um, water to flow by. And in this case, we see it as a 16% improvement in splicing shown here. One of the things that we did next was that we were interested in looking, and you can uh, go to the next slide. We were interested in looking at a muscle-specific um, biomarker. So when we looked at the 22 biomarkers that, again, was, was identified by the research network, this was a broad panel of, of biomarkers. And what we were really interested in is to be able to understand whether a more specific um, set of biomarkers might provide a better map or um, guide to how clinical development, development should go, as well as maybe early signs of activity. Uh, in people. So what we did was um, looked at this muscle specific panel. You can see the, you know, for those that are really into the molecular biology, we have the muscle specific panel genes outline. And if you if you understand kind of the, the genes that are involved are the first one is the chloride channel. So the chloride channel is really uh, important for relaxing your muscle. Um, the second one is the calcium channel, which is also involved in both contraction as well as relaxation. ATP2A1 is also known, uh, perhaps some of you might know it better, as circa 1, and it's involved in calcium regulation. And then BIN1 is a really key protein in your muscle involved in both relaxation as well as contraction. So these four genes we thought were really important to look at early that might predict what patients would um, perhaps respond the earliest. And you can see from our, these are shown on the right-hand panel, our individual patients, their splicing panel. And what you can see is that we, in the one meg per kg um, patient panel, we saw one participant that showed a really nice improvement, even though that was our lowest dose and only one dose. And Nick will show you a video from this person that uh, relates to myotonia. As we continue dosing at the higher doses, that is two mg per kg, this is dosed uh, two times, and then looking at a biopsy after, after two doses, that is two doses that are six weeks apart. So the two mg per kg, the dark blue patients, they're on drug for 12 weeks or three months. We then look at a biopsy, and these are the data from those individual patients. And what you can see is that the majority of those patients are showing improvements in, uh, in splicing. So really, really uh, exciting data to see that improvement. Now you'll see that there are some patients that aren't yet responding. So we're hoping that those patients will respond. And our goal is to have everybody uh, respond. So we're interested in not only the responders, but the people who have yet to respond to kind of understand the molecular biology behind those. 
uh, and we're working diligently to try to understand it. It's still early. Um, like I said at the beginning, we're learning a lot of things. This is the first time this has ever been done. No one's been able to knock down DMPK in humans. So we're really chart in, we're in uncharted territory and trying to understand everything about this disease uh, with these early data. So what I wanted to do, I think, is the next slide will we'll transla translate um, just again to give you an overview of what we've talked about, knowing that we've moved through it pretty quickly. And then I'll hand it back over to Nick, who'll walk us through the videos. So again, the first step in this cascade of events was delivery to muscle. If we can deliver to muscle for the first time ever in humans, can we then knock down this DMPK, the mutant DMPK, show that that knockdown occurs. And the only way that you're gonna get splicing is if you have knockdown of DMPK in the nucleus, which then allows muscle blind like protein to be released. That muscle blind like protein goes on to splice the RNAs properly. And that's what we showed as improvement in splicing. And then we'll, we'll show you some of the early videos where that improvement in splicing translates to a functional benefit. So it's very much of a cascade of events where we've tried to connect the dots between delivery, inhibiting the, the specific mutant gene in the nucleus, showing that it has splicing improvement resulting in functional benefit. So we're really on the way, we hope to unclogging that sink and allowing the, uh, the production of new proteins that leads to functional benefit. So I'll pass it on to Nick, who will walk us through some of the video hand opening. Nick, off to you. Great. Um, so um, before we start the videos, I just wanted to orient you, because uh, it's actually quite a bit, it's, it's a lot to look at. Um, if you're in the audience and you have myotonia, you can squeeze your hand now and watch it relax. So you can get a, get a feel uh, for what this, what this looks like uh, for you. But this is, um, as Mike um, mentioned, this is um, a single patient in that first cohort. So a single dose at the lowest dose. Um, and you can see their baseline video hand opening time, day 43, so six weeks after the single dose, and then again, 12 weeks and then 24 weeks. And what I hope you can see is that you can see a change in that myotonia specifically at day 43. And then you can see that it's um, it wears off. So, you know, it's worse on the baseline. It's best on day 43. It gets a little bit, um, a little bit worse on day 92. And then by day 183, it's back. So with all that, fingers crossed, um, Alyssa, uh, do you want to play the video? And squeeze, 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 and open. So I, I just, I mean, I that always gives me chills. I'm, I'm very excited to see that change um, so early on at the, at such a low dose. Um, and I hope that you could see it on those videos, but if not, um, these will be um, posted so you'll be able to watch it again. Um, and um, let's go to the next one. So here, same orientation. Now you're looking at um, the early responder from cohort B1. So this is two milligrams per kilogram. And then again, you'll see the baseline video. And then you see that uh, six weeks after the first dose, six weeks after the second dose, and then 12 weeks after the third dose. So um, now, um, you know, because we're going through multiple doses, um, you can see that actually the improvement that's present at um, day 43 um, is more persistent, uh, which, is, which is great. But let's go ahead and show the video. Ready? And squeeze, 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 and open. So you can hear, you can really see that dose, that dose matters and that, um, you know, even though there was a bit of a benefit at that one milligram dose here at two milligrams, 
um, you know, there's more of a benefit and it's it's more sustained. And this would not be something that we would expect to see. You don't see the myotonia improve by itself over this period of time um, um, in the disease. So I think this is a really a great early clue um, about um, uh, the, the change in myotonia. Next slide. We'll show that last video one more time so you can see just at the beginning, at the very end, um, after 12 weeks. Go ahead and show it one more time. Ready? And squeeze, 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 and open. A really, really um, very impressive, and I think this is a, an encouraging sign uh, for this very early um, clinical development plan here. And I will pass it back, I think, to Mike. Thanks, Nick. So um, that was that was great. I'm so glad the videos were able to work well. Um, so I just wanted to kind of wrap up quickly uh, today. You know, we're really excited to show that we're delivering on the platform and that we're having an impact on the disease mechanism at this early time point. Again, it's super early. It's encouraging. We have a lot to learn. Uh, there's a lot that we don't know, but we do. But it is. Um, really exciting these early data. First, we've demonstrated delivery to muscle, a first for the field and something that we've been working on for a long time. We've demonstrated that you can see achieve um, meaningful DMPK knockdown in 100% of, of the patients that we've treated. And we see a 45% change in DMPK in those participants. That Decrease in DMPK then translates to improvements in splicing. We see a 16% improvement in splicing across a 22 gene panel and a 31% improvement on key specific um, muscle specific panel. And we showed the, Nick just showed the early signs of clinical activity at, um, and we see myotonia improvement just weeks after dosing with our two lowest doses in the trial. Next slide, please. It uh, talks about our next uh, next steps. So Marina is ongoing. It's randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled. Um, we we shared uh, initial assessment and our early readout from the trial. We'll share additional top-line data next year. Um, we're continue to re resolve the partial clinical hold. Um, so that we can start having new participants again, hopefully. Um, safety of participants in our clinical trials are top priority. And we'll anticipate sharing an update on the partial clinical hold at the end of the first quarter in 2023. We're hopeful that the results from the Marie tri MARINA trial will support advancing AOC 1001 into a pivotal trial. And we're partnering with DM1 patient advocacy community to get you more information and resources as soon as they're available. And with that, I'll pass it on to Kelly. Thanks, everybody. Um, I think uh, at this point, I just wanted to reiterate that we are deeply committed to you, the myotonic um, dystrophy community, and we're excited to have uh, been able to share this information with you. And we'll be moving into the um, into the Q and A portion now. So, Mike, if you can come back on camera, um, as a, as some of you have seen, um, you can ask questions live. I've been trying to address some of them in the background, and we'll we'll have some conversation here. And also, we did receive over 300 questions ahead of the call, so. We tried to uh, group some of them together to be able to answer your questions here. So um, my first question is gonna go to Dr. Johnson. Um, Dr. Johnson, can you answer the question? We've got it in, in various different forms, but how patients are selected for clinical trials, how they can join clinical trials, how their families can find out about clinical trials, et cetera. Um, it, there's a number of questions that have come in just like, can I get my child in the study? Can I get myself in a study, et cetera? Great, uh, great questions. Um, so the, the first and best thing you can do is either you can go to the MDF website, you can go to clinicaltrials.gov, 
Um, there you'll see uh, some contact information for the Myotide Dispute Clinical Research Network or DMCRN. Um, and those sites are doing these clinical trials um, across the uh, a, you know, variety of clinical trials. And so um, find the one that's closest to you, or you can always reach out to our coordinating centers at Rochester and VCU and just send some information. And we'll see how best we can help facilitate that process. Um, uh, for our natural history studies, those are very broadly um, inclusive and, and many patients will qualify. Uh, for these clinical trials, these are really focused on first on safety. So I think it's important to remember that these early clinical trials focus most on those individuals where we, we think it's safest to test these new therapies um, and where we think we might see um, potentially early changes. So I think, um, unfortunately, the, the early trials are never the full group of individuals, and, and I know Avidi and others are working on trying to expand those populations as much as possible as, as the programs move forward. Great, thank you so much. Another question related to this um, for you, Mike, is do you plan or does Avidity plan to broaden eligibility criteria as we move forward with um, our program if we are able to come off of the clinical hold? Yeah, so um, yeah, I, I think the key thing is right now we're currently on our partial clinical hold as we outlined. Um, so we're not enrolling any additional patients. And as Nick outlined also is that um, right now, kind of the eligibility criteria are, are relatively narrow and defined um, as we kind of start enrolling so we can best understand the safety and then understand um, how the data comes out from that. But we hope to, as we expand trials, as we move to a, a pivotal trial, that we can start expanding eligibility to include as many people as possible uh, that are living with DM1. So that would be that would be our goal and the idea that, you know, at the at the end of the day, we, we want everyone to be able to benefit from therapeutics that are coming to the market. And I think it's an exciting time um, that we have a number of, of companies that are moving forward. So my my suggestion would be, you know, while you may not uh, be able to to come into our trial, I would look broadly and look at other possible trials also that that are going to be coming to the uh, the space and encourage you to enroll in any trial that you're that you can because as a community we want everyone to be able to. Um, benefit from any of the therapeutics. Excellent. Thank you so much. One additional question that I think I can address is um, we've seen some questions come across about researching the potential for treatment of DM2. And I just wanted to acknowledge that we do recognize that there's a huge unmet need here as well for the DM2 community. And we believe that we have the potential to leverage learnings from what we have, um, what we're gaining in DM1 um, with the community across the board to potentially research treatments for the future. AOC 1001, because of the way that it is designed to target the mutant DMPK, really is very specific to myotonic dystrophy type one. Um, but uh, we hope that either what we can do or other companies can do will be able to address the need for DM2 in the future. Um, sort of along those lines, Dr. Johnson, um, one of the questions, and I think we've addressed it somewhat, but I think it's come across a, a couple times just around what um, additional things outside of myotonia would you expect from a treatment that uh, targets um, the root cause of DM1? And what are you kind of thinking you may see in the future? Uh, that's a great yeah, question. Yeah, et cetera. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, we showed myotonia and, and myotonia makes sense to look at um, first because it's something that we think can change um, probably pretty quickly since it's related to the chloride channel. I didn't get into the biology there, but um, within the skeletal muscle changes and muscle weakness and wasting um, and for molecules like um, this one, uh, which get into a lot of different organ tissues, uh, you know, it's, there's a potential to have um, effects, you know, potentially, like I said, heart, breathing, uh, GI tract, it, um, you know, it, it for each one like this, it really depends on how, how many tissues um, they get into. So, um, you know, unfortunately, some of those 
um, signs and symptoms are less well studied than the muscle. And so um, a lot of what we're doing in clinical trials is listening to you and, and watching how it unfolds, um, watching and seeing what changes, uh, particularly in early trials like this. Super, thank you so much. I know that we're running over time, so I think that uh, we've addressed the majority of the questions either in the talk or in these. So um, I, I would love to hand back over unless there's anything Mike, you and Nick would like to say as a closing remark. No, okay. Thanks for having me. Thank yeah. you so much for joining everybody. Thanks so much for having us. Ah, thank you so much, Team Avidity. This was fantastic. Thank you for talking with our community today. It's very exciting progress, and we're grateful to learn more of the details of the impact of AOC 1001 to date. Um, so thank you all again, and on behalf of MDF's board and staff, we wish you very happy holidays. Take good care. <laughs>